Welcome to EuroPCR 2023. My name is Vijay Konadian. I'm Professor of Interventional Cardiology from Newcastle University, Newcastle upon Tyne, United Kingdom. I'm also an academic interventional cardiologist based at Freeman Hospital, Newcastle upon Tyne. It really is my absolute honor to be joined by Professor Javier Escanet, uh, interventional cardiologist and professor of cardiology from uh, Madrid, Spain. Uh, and more than that, he is a mentor to so many people across the world and also a mentor to me. And, uh, and I'm very proud to say he was also the recipient of the Andreas Grunzing Award of the European Society of Cardiology last year. The reason why the two of us are here today is because we just had an outstanding INOCA session here at EuroPCR 2023. And uh, also, we wrote together the EAPCI consensus document on Inoka, which from my point of view essentially raised the awareness, awareness of Inoka worldwide among patients as well as among clinicians, the way they are looking after these patients and stimulating research. So, um, Professor Eskened, tell us what is Inoka and why should, always, why should we be bothered about it? Thank you, Vijay. Well, it's a... I think that Inoka is something that has been ignored for a long, long time. Yeah. So it's nothing new. It's something that has been there, but we were not able to call it in the right uh, way. And it's actually ischemia of non-obstructive origin. And um, I think that most of the colleagues understand now that for a long time, the paradigm of ischemic coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease was basically based on the idea that you have obstructions in the epicardial vessels and that this is causing ischemia. Yeah. Uh, and of course, at the university, you were told that there was also this possibility of having derangements in the coronary microcirculation, but the fact is that when you arrive to clinical practice, nothing was done about it. Yeah. So I think that this is what INOCA is. It's, it's, it's a new term that in a way um, speaks about something that has been there for a long time, but really needs to be addressed. Yeah. So we're really essentially addressing the unmet need of something that we have known about for a long time and uh, getting to the bottom of it so that we can help our patients. So could you tell us what, what are the different mechanisms that are associated? Of course, INOCA essentially stands for ischemia with non-obstructive coronary artery. So patients come to us with symptoms and sometimes we do non-invasive investigations and find ischemia, sometimes we don't. And then there is a tendency for everybody to say, actually, nothing wrong with you. I'm going to discharge you from the cardiology clinic. But what we are learning is that there is more to what we actually see on the angiogram that we really need to do for our patients. So exactly. So when we speak about the NOCA, we are talking about um, patients with chronic coronary syndromes. You may have also derangements in the coronary microcirculation or other causes of ischemia in patients who have acute coronary syndromes, for example. So every time we are talking about um, INOCA, we are referring to patients with what we call chronic coronary syndromes. And the, the cause of uh, these symptoms uh, that these patients have, um, avoiding deliberately the word angina, uh, it are obvious to different mechanisms of ischemia, different types of ischemia, if you wish. Yeah. This is something that, so we have, we have different types of angina and different types of yeah. ischemia. Yeah. Um, as you well know, because you work very actively in this field, um, since we, we, we now are aware that one of the reasons because women were ignored yeah. as, say, as suffering coronary artery disease is because frequently the symptoms they have are not the typical Heberden angina, where yes. you have a specific pattern of chest pain, which is caused by obstruction of an epicardial vessel. Yes. So in the same way, the mechanisms of ischemia that you have in Inoka may be caused by different mechanisms, which broadly we can separate into big groups. Mm. One of them are vasomotor disorders, where you have uh, dysregulation in the, in the vasomotor control of the epicardial or microvascular vessels, mm. uh, arterioles. Yeah. And the other one is what we may broadly put together as structural derangements of the coronary microcirculation. For example, that the density of capillaries decrease enormously as a consequence of hypertension affecting the ventricle yeah. and generating, you know, also myocardial fibrosis, etc., or to the fact that arterioles uh, get thick and narrow and that they cannot uh, conduct the blood in the same way or they cannot uh, um, vasodilate in the same way that they will do in normal conditions. Yeah. 
So essentially, it's the mechanism is abnormal vasodilatation, which is what we're classifying as coronary microvascular dysfunction. And obviously, we don't see this microvasculature on the angiogram, and, and, and sometimes the, the, any of the ischemia tests don't detect them. And using the various tools that we have in the, ca in the catheter laboratory, we are able to identify them. So that's one of the endotype or the mechanism. And the other one is the vasomotor disorder, which can happen in the epicardial vessel as well as in the microvascular uh, vessel. So when it happens, you have a microvascular uh, epicardial spasm, and then you have microvascular spasm. And it's really important for us to differentiate these endotypes so we can provide the right uh, treatment for our patients. So, um, so what, are the, what are the specific investigations in addition to angiography we need to do in order to diagnose these uh, specific mechanisms, Javier? Yes, so for, for, for the uh, vasomotor disorders, uh, typically the test that we use nowadays is the acetylcholine testing. Uh, there is nothing as effective in diagnosing vasomotor disorders like this test. Other surrogates, like could be hyperventilation, for example, is something yeah. that has been used in the past, but is less, uh, much less sensitive. What is the beauty of uh, the acetylcholine testing that you have to perform in the cath lab, uh, making a slow injection of acetylcholine in the vessels? Is that it provides information on the function of the endothelial cells, mm. but also on the presence of hyperreactivity of smooth muscle cells, which are the two main mechanisms yes. that uh, account for these uh, derangements in, in, in vasomotor control. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you, you do that with low doses of acetylcholine, you can test the endothelial function, higher doses are testing the um, hyperreactivity of smooth muscle cells. Yeah. And on the, on the other hand, uh, if you want to explore the um, endotype, uh, it's a group of patients that have um, a structural uh, anomalies in the coronary microcirculation, then you typically use uh, adenosine to check the dynamicity of the coronary microcirculation in terms of increasing flow and also of um, the um, uh, minimal resistance that this network has. Yeah. Uh, we have to remember that resistance is the inverse of conductance. Conductance is the ability of the vessels to, 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 to deliver flow. Yeah. So you can imagine that uh, in someone who imagine you have m m millions of capillaries in, in, in the territory that you're exploring and 20%, 50% of them are gone, you're going to have an increase in resistance. Yeah. By the way, this is something misleading in, in the terminology and we're still adjusting things. Typically, people refer to this type of test like checking the vasodilatory capacity of the circulation. It is clear that if 50% of your capillaries have, are gone, yeah. the, there is not going to be vaso, possible vasodilation. Yeah. So when you see that coronary flow reserve is limited uh, in response to adenosine, it may simply indicate that um, there is a rarefaction of the, of the microvasculature, that there is a loss of density of the capillary network. Yeah. So once we've identified the, the mechanisms or the endotypes, obviously, to treat these patients, uh, from my side, how I manage these patients is, you know, giving, you know, of course, we pay so much attention to risk factors when they come with blocked arteries in the setting of STEMI or NSTEMI. We should give the same precedence to, to our INOCA endotypes as well because they, the risk factors are the primary driver for the abnormalities that occur in the microvasculature, risk factors such as hypertension, for example. So as part of the management, it's really important that we address all of that and lifestyle uh, factors, for example, stress management, weight control, etc. So obviously, once we have done that, then tailoring or targeting the therapy based on the mechanism or the, or the endotype that we have. And of course, for the uh, vasomotor disorders, um, drugs like calcium channel blockers or nitrates uh, do help these patients. And specifically for vasomotor, uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction, beta blockers might be the initial therapy that we look for. But also there are situations where people can have both. They have vasomotor disorder as well as uh, problems with their vasodilatation. One of the things that I learned from uh, working on the various documents as well as from this session is that we mustn't be afraid to uptitrate the medication beyond what we normally will give for, uh, for, for our patient. And it's again targeting the patient to make sure that we are getting on top of their 
their symptoms. Would you agree with that? Fully agree. Fully agree. So the, um, I mean, just to, to summarize what you have said, and I fully agree with that, is that obviously, if um, if you first of all is that we have effective uh, drugs in treating these patients. This is something that you know is important to highlight because I believe that there is some type of therapeutic nihilism among the community where they think, oh, but we don't have drugs to treat these patients, so mm. what is the reason to, to perform these tests? No, we have drugs that we use every day, like beta blockers, like calcium channel blockers, like statins, yeah. like, that are very, very uh, powerful in these yes. patients. Yeah. Second one is that unless you understand which is the causative, causative mechanism, you cannot set an effective treatment. This yes. is something that is quite clear, and that's the importance of outlining which is the dominant endotype that you yeah. have in the patient. Yeah. And the third one is that, um, as you say, is that it's sometimes it's, it's, it's you still, even when you know that you have a particular endotype, you still need to modify treatment yeah. because not everyone responds in the same way to every calcium channel blocker, etc., etc. That is one of the arguments why not to go for trial and error. In many occasions, the colleague says, well, okay, so if I see that there, is no, there are no coronary arteries, I can do trial and error and give calcium channel blockers. Uh, then I, if there is no response, I assume that it is a structural and I give it a blockers. That will not be possible, don't you think so? I mean, you really need to be guided by what you found, by your objective evidence. Absolutely, for your, by your objective evidence and also how the patient is responding uh, to the treatment that we are providing to them. So, so that's really fantastic. I, I really do hope that we have been able to convince uh, our colleagues as well as our patients to come seek help when they are uh, suffering from this uh, condition so that uh, one day, uh, this condition will no longer be underdiagnosed and undertreated, that everybody will be aware to go and look for this mechanism and treat our patients accordingly, and ultimately with the goal of reducing uh, the global burden of heart disease uh, in both men and women, because these conditions also occur in, uh, in male patients. Absolutely. I yeah. think that, you know, at this point, a part of the prognostic consequences that, you know, having Inoka may have, uh, this has a profound impact in the quality of life of yes. these patients. And the first step of breaking, you know, the vicious circle in which the patient is trapped for in many occasions for years is to come to a diagnosis. And I'm sure that you also have uh, seen, you know, the, the, the satisfaction of the patient when you say, yeah. when you come and say, we, have, we found something. Yes. Because they've yeah. been in so many occasions, you know, they've been told, well, you know, everything is normal. Yeah. We cannot see anything that is wrong with you. Yeah. And now you found something and they're ready to wear with, the, you know, the, the, the time that will take to find the right treatment and to improve their quality of life and symptoms. Yeah. Thank you so much, Xavier, for joining us. Thank and you thank you all uh, for joining us in this edition of EuroPCR 2023.